Alors, bonjour, bon matin, good morning to all. Merci de vous joindre à nous aujourd'hui. J'aimerais d'abord souligner que nous nous sommes réunis sur le territoire non cédé du peuple algonquin Anishinaabe. Au Canada, depuis 2019, la tarification de la pollution est un fondement de notre strat stratégie climatique à l'échelle de l'économie. La tarification de la pollution fonctionne. Elle réduit la pollution, elle remet de l'argent dans les poches des familles qui travaillent dur et elle pousse l'industrie à mettre en œuvre des solutions plus propres. Cette approche fonctionne et aujourd'hui, j'ai des nouvelles importantes sur la façon dont nous allons nous assurer qu'elle continue à faire ce pour quoi elle a été conçue. We've created a pollution pricing system where, over time, it becomes more expensive to pollute. This is designed to get rid of what we don't want, pollution, and encourage what we do want, things like clean innovation that will grow our economy, create good jobs, and build a bright future for our kids and grandkids. Over the last year, provinces and territories had a chance to submit their proposals on how they want to update their systems for pricing pollution. Some provinces also opted to use or keep using the federal pollution pricing system. Nous avons créé un système de tarification de la pollution auquel, au fil du temps, il devient plus coûteux de polluer. Le système est conçu pour éliminer ce que nous ne voulons pas, la pollution, et encourager ce que nous voulons. L'innovation propre qui fera croître notre économie créera des emplois et bâtira un avenir prospère pour nos enfants et nos petits-enfants. Au cours de la dernière année, les provinces et les territoires ont eu l'occasion de soumettre leurs propositions sur la façon dont ils souhaitaient mettre à jour leur système de tarification de la pollution. Certaines provinces ont également choisi d'utiliser ou de continuer à utiliser le système fédéral de tarification du carbone. Today, I can share what this means across the country. Let's start with industry. The federal output-based pricing system for industry will continue to apply in Manitoba, Nunavut, Yukon and Prince Edward Island. Big changes, though. The OPBS will cease to apply in sectors of Saskatchewan, and that's because I'm very happy to announce that Saskatchewan has proposed its own expanded and strengthened system for industries in, in Saskatchewan. I also want to applaud Alberta for their strengthened plan, which is driving in Canada's one of the most vibrant clean energy investment market in the country. There's also big news for Canadian families. Under the new system, more families will get the Climate Action Incentive checks more often. This is because three more provinces, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, and PEI will be joining Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Yukon, and Nunavut in using the federal system for fuel. If you live in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador, or Prince Edward Island, you can expect to get the Climate Action Incentive check for the first time ever this July. And people in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta will not only keep getting the Climate Action Incentive rebate payments every three months, the amounts will actually go up starting in April. So it's important to know that the rebate payments arrive before the fuel charge is felt. Eight out of ten households will get more money back than what they pay, with lower- and middle-income families benefiting the most. It's also important to know that this winter there will be no impact on home heating costs in these Atlantic provinces because the system only comes into effect on July 1st of 2023. And as I said earlier, people will receive the payment before the new system kicks into place. So starting next July, a family in four in Nova Scotia will get $248, in PI $240, in Newfoundland and Labrador, $328, four times a year. And people in places you already get the Climate Action Incentive, the quarterly rebates will go up as April 1st. So a family of four will get $386 in Alberta, $340 in Saskatchewan, $264 in Manitoba, and $244 in Ontario. Direct payments will keep coming every three months. In total, 90% of the fuel char charge proceeds are returned directly to Canadian households through the Climate Action Incentive Payment. And businesses, farmers, indigenous, indigenous peoples get the other 10%. Nous savons que c'est possible de lutter contre les changements climatiques tout en rendant la vie plus abordable. Évidemment, ce n'est pas tous les politiciens qui sont d'accord avec ça. En fait, vous allez probablement entendre des gens comme Pierre Polièvre être très critique. Et même si les 
politiciens conservateurs vont redoubler leurs attaques mensongères contre la tarification carbone, même si Pierre Poliev dira qu'il retirait les chèques d'action, d'incitation à l'action climatique aux familles, même s'il veut rendre la pollution à nouveau gratuite en ne proposant aucun plan pour lutter contre les changements climatiques, nous allons continuer à défendre ce que nous savons être important. Il faut prendre des mesures audacieuses pour garder notre air propre, créer de bons emplois et rendre la vie plus abordable. Now, Pierre Polyev won't agree. For that, we don't agree on much. Because conservative politicians will double down on their misleading attacks on pollution pricing. They will say that these climate action incentive checks, will, they would take them away from families. Polyev will make sure to say that he wants to make pollution free again with absolutely no plan to fight climate change. But we're going to keep taking bold action to keep our air clean, create good jobs, and make life more affordable for families. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. J'aimerais maintenant passer la parole à mon collègue et ami, le ministre Seamus O'Regan. Merci, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Everybody. So, two things are clear right now. First, inflation is tough. Households are feeling the pinch, and everything that we do right now as a government has to take that into consideration. Second, climate change is real, and it's not taking a break because of inflation. Just ask the residents of Newfoundland's southeast, southwest coast. Um, I visited Porta Basque, Ramia, Burgio, Burnt Islands, Isla Mort, Fox Roost Marguerite. It's affecting our fishery. It's affecting everything. It's affecting where the fish go. This is about making life more affordable while lowering emissions. That's it. That's the job. And that's what we're doing. Rendre la, la, vie, la vie plus abordable en réduisant, réduisant les émissions. C'est notre travail. C'est ce qu'on fait. Starting next July, more Canadians, including those in my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, are going to see more money in their bank accounts as they start to receive climate action incentive payments, something that people in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta have enjoyed for several years now. Ça a toujours être notre plan avec le prix sur la pollution, que les Canadiens obtiennent un remboursement. Mais... On est une fédération. Chaque province et territoire est différent. Alors, on a tous pris des chemins différents pour arriver là. That was always our plan with the price on pollution, for Canadians to get the rebate. But when we're a federation, and every province and territory is different, and we have all taken different routes to get here. In Newfoundland and Labrador, for example, the province was in a tough financial spot four years ago, and the government of the day chose to direct the revenue from pollution pricing into the province's budget. I'm very happy to say that our province is doing a lot better now. And it's time for that money now to go directly to people's household budgets. And it is. Starting next July. Not now. Not the winter. Starting next July. A family of four in Newfoundland and Labrador will see their first quarterly check for $328. In Nova Scotia, they will get $248. In Prince Edward Island, $240, four times a year. That is all money that is upfront and over the course of a full year. For that family in Newfoundland and Labrador, that works out to $1,312. $992 for that family in Nova Scotia. $960 for that family in PEI. Eight in 10 families are going to get back more than they pay in. Seniors, low and middle income families will all benefit. So when you see a price being put on pollution, that is not money lost. That money is now coming back to you. And you're going to see it in your bank account four times a year. Huit familles sur dix vont recevoir plus qu'elles ont payé. Les personnes âgées, les familles à faibles et moyens revenus en bénéficieront tous. Donc, quand vous voyez un prix sur la pollution, ce n'est pas de l'argent perdu. Cet argent va maintenant vous revenir. Et vous allez le recevoir dans votre compte bancaire quatre, quatre fois par an. For those living with home heating oil, if you switch to a heat pump, 
using federal or provincial grants, you'll be that much further ahead. Home heating oil is emissions intensive, it is expensive, and it is completely vulnerable to global price shocks. Also, just to be really clear, strengthened price on pollution isn't coming into force until spring, so it won't have any effect on prices this winter. In September, a quarter billion dollars was put into the Low Carbon Economic Economy Fund to transition households to more efficient energy sources. Almost half that $250 million will go to Atlantic Canada. And yesterday, we announced new $5,000 grants to help people in Atlantic Canada make that switch from oil to electric heat pumps. At today's electricity and heating oil prices, a heat pump can save a household literally thousands of additional dollars per year. Pollution pricing is working. Pollution pricing lowers emissions. The rebate works. Eight out of 10 families, eight out of 10 families, eight out of 10 people are gonna see more money in their bank accounts. Lower emissions, cut costs, that's the job. Le prix, le prix de la pollution fonctionne. Les gens polluent davantage lorsqu'ils n'ont pas à payer pour la pollution. La rabais fonctionne. Huit personnes sur dix vont recevoir plus d'argent dans leur compte en banque. Réduire les émissions, réduire les coûts, c'est ça notre travail. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, P.S. Julie Brusson. Thank you, Seamus. Et moi, je vais continuer à parler le prix de pollution et um, l'action climatique. Alors, on va parler de qu'est-ce qui se passe et qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour les familles en Ontario. What does today's announcement mean for families in Ontario? Oh, as you just heard, the climate action incentive payments that people in Ontario are receiving already will be going up. For a family of four, the direct rebate check will increase to be $244 every three months. That would be a total of $976 a year. So for about eight out of 10 Ontario families, that's more than they pay. There's been a lot of noise about pollution pricing, and I think that that's why it's so important, actually, that we're having this conversation today, because some are setting a false narrative, one that fails to mention half the equation. The re rebates used to be less visible because they were on our tax returns. But starting this past July, we changed to quarterly payments, helping families throughout the year. And the checks are arri arriving in Ontario family bank accounts and mailboxes every three months. And every dollar that is part of the price on carbon pollution in Ontario stays in Ontario. Not only that, but by updating pollution pricing system, we're stepping up our ambition in the fight against climate change. We have smart programs to boost zero emission vehicles, better insulate homes, and now huge investments, as we just heard, about helping people to transition off home heating oil. We're combining a price on pollution with powerful financial incentives to make the switch to cleaner energy. So while some people want to take these away, these climate action incentive checks, and to make it free to pollute again, we're standing up for what we know matters, putting more money in people's pockets, building a strong Ontario economy, and keeping our air clean for our kids and our grandkids. I have the joy now to say that we'll be taking questions now. Thank you. And we'll start with the questions in the room. Uh, reporters online, if you can use the raise hand function to notify us of your question. Journalist en ligne, si vous pouvez utiliser la fonction levée la main pour nous aviser de votre question. Mia? Good afternoon, Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press. Uh, Minister Gilbo, it's, it seems that the debate on institutional or industrial pricing seems to be over. Most provinces have agreed to put their own on. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of back and forth on that. The debate seems to now to be about the consumer carbon levy. Would you agree with that? And why do you think that there's still such a debate on whether or not to put a price on, on uh, pollution when it comes to consumers? I, I would agree that, uh, by and large, the, the, the discussions with, with provinces and territories on the output-based system was a um, 
rather smooth one with most jurisdictions in 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 the country. Uh, frankly, there's a, there's only one exception where it, it was more complicated. But I I'm not sure um, why some provinces are are choosing to to agree that we need to pr put a price on pollution for 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 industrial users, but that we shouldn't be putting a price on on fuel that we use in, in our everyday lives. And and it is the very purpose of of pricing. We we want to make pollution more expensive, but we don't want to do that on the backs of, of Canadians' families, hence the climate incentive payment. It also seems from your, all of the comments made today that the government is being very forceful about the, the rebates and trying to get out a little bit more information about them. Is this an acknowledgement that that information hasn't really reached people, that people aren't as aware of those rebates? And and that more needs to be done in order to get buy-in from the public on the carbon pricing program? Um, as, as, as Julie said, I, I think that before it was on, the, on our income tax, so probably less visible than, than it is now with the quarterly, the quarterly payments. And I, I mean, and as Seamus said, we, we recognize that many people are struggling right now with inflation. And we want Canadians to know that we have their backs and, and we're there to ensure that we have cleaner air and cleaner water and a brighter future for our, for our families, for our communities, for our workers, while at the same time helping them through these difficult times. Hi, David Thurton, CBC. Um, I'm just going to ask this question about New Brunswick. Um, New Brunswick's 2019 carbon price has a built-in instant rebate of the carbon tax on natural gas bills. So does your approval of the province's plan mean that rebate is gone or remains so this rebate that they get on natural gas is that still in place i would have to defer to one of our technical people for for that i don't have the information in front of me but we can get it for you yes okay. um and then i guess just globally speaking or nationally speaking here is this decision to impose the federal fuel charge on these atlantic provinces is this something that you're happy to do or reluctant to do? Does it say anything about, I guess, the government's grand plans on, on carbon pricing? I mean, the hope was that jurisdictions would come up with their own plans and would meet your benchmark. Actually, we were, ever since we, we put in place pricing in Canada, we were very agnostic in terms of whether or not you know, provinces or jurisdictions would have their own system or, or use the federal system. And we continue, we, we continue to be. It is really up to them to decide what they want, as, as Seamus said, we are in the Federation and we have to, to be able to take into account different regional uh, realities in, in the country. And that's exactly what, what we've done w with our system. The, what we are trying to do is create more fairness across, uh, across the board and, and to ensure that what every jurisdiction is doing, whether they have their own system or they're using the federal system, is equivalent and passes a, fed a federal benchmark. And, and that's, that was the process we, we've been engaged on for over a year with, with provinces and territories, both on, on, uh, on the industrial side as well on, uh, as on the fuel charge. Okay. I'll speak to that <laughs> briefly. Um, uh, on behalf of the good people of St. John South, Mount Pearl, I'm thrilled. Um, and I'll let other MPs from Atlantic Canada speak for themselves, but this is just more money for them. More money back in their pocket, more money than they were getting before. Um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, we, we each let provinces make their own choices. And when we came up with this, our, our intention was always that taxpayers would benefit. It would, as Julie mentioned, it would remain in each respective province. Um, but we wanted, we wanted taxpayers to get it back. At the same time, we had to allow provinces to come up with their own systems. Uh, and that's actually a benefit of the Federation. Sometimes, who knows, they, a, a provincial jurisdiction come up with a better idea uh, than us. All the better, and maybe we'll learn from that. With Newfoundland and Labrador, they needed the, the revenue quite badly at the time. Um, they are in uh, less of a pickle now, thankfully, because uh, of agreements we've reached with them on rate mitigation, on the Atlantic Accord, on royalty sharing. Um, and uh, they're better now. So we are in a position now where we can return. Uh, that money directly to consumers. They are going to get more back than they were before. Um, you know, this is uh, this is good news. I'm quite quite happy to be standing here in front of you and say that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are getting more money than they would have before. Yep. And we'll go to online questions. Michael Gorman, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, for Minister Gilbo, I'm wondering to what extent the decision to delay the implementation of the fuel surcharge in Atlantic Canada is a reflection of how many people currently use home heating fuel 
uh, how cold it already is and how difficult it would be to make transitions and changes at such short notice? Uh, there's there's no delay. Uh, obviously, adjusting this between the federal government and, and, and provinces take, takes time. And, and as I said, we've been working on this for, for, for more than a month. And our goal was always that this would start in 2023. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Sorry, perhaps I wasn't clear there, Minister. I, I mean the fact that it's kicking in, in in July, well after heating season, as opposed to, say, April, when it, it, it still may be cold. But for the sake of not losing my follow-up, I'll also ask you that right now. Um, I, I, I wonder what your response would be to folks in Atlantic Canada who are about to see gas prices go up and home heating fuel go up, and they wonder... What is the point of this if, in effect, I'm going to be getting all of this money back in the long run anyway? So a, a couple of things. If you're using oil to heat your home, you're, you have no control on, on prices, and, and your, your provincial energy regulator has no control over the prices. Those prices are determined internationally. And, and and also nationally by uh, the fact that, you know, it is interesting that the Conservative Party would fight pri carbon pricing so much uh, when on average what we're doing will represent three cents a litre across the country, where they say nothing about the fact that refining margins in Canada have gone up by more than 100 percent in the last two years, last two years alone. So the fact that it's costing more money for people to heat their own or to use their, their, their vehicles is not because of, of, of pricing pollution in Canada. It's because of oil companies making a lot of money out of this. And it's also because of international issues like the, inv the illegal invasion of, of Ukraine by, by, by Russia. By switching to, 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 to heat pumps, um, they're cleaner, they're more efficient, and they're way more cheaper to operate. And on top of that, Electricity, the price of electricity is regulated across all of Canada's federation with very few exceptions. So it's not up to the markets to decide how price can go up, but energy regulators have yearly, uh, yearly audits on, uh, on this. So you have certainty that maybe the price will go up over time, but nothing like, like what we've seen on, um, on the price of, of, of gasoline or home heating oil. Thank you. I, would, I, would just, I will add just, oh, um, you know, every, every province in Atlantic Canada, too, is different. Um, I believe for home heating oil in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's somewhere around 15 percent. Um, we are actually, we benefit greatly, I think, on our grid. It's generally about 60 percent hydroelectricity. Um, so, but for those 15 percent, uh, you know, I think that this will make a huge difference. Stephen's point on heat pumps, I mean, heat pumps are even way more efficient than just regular electric heat. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe in Newfoundland and Labrador that... Uh, these past few summers, we need air conditioners for the first time in my life, but we actually do, uh, which, you know, I can laugh at, but I don't know in the medium long term if that's necessarily a good sign. Um, but we do need air conditioners. So I've been I've been really encouraging my constituents, my friends, neighbors to uh, to look at the program seriously. Laurent Rigaud, please go ahead. Allez-y, la parole est à vous. Laurent Rigaud, la parole est à vous. Oui, est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui. Oui, bonjour. J'ai une question pour euh, le ministre Guilbeault, Laurent Rigaud à Charlottetown. Pouvez-vous nous expliquer en quoi la taxe carbone qu'a proposée euh, l'île du Prince-Édouard ne respecte pas euh, les critères fédéraux Qu'est-ce qui vous a déplu dans la proposition de l'île du Prince-Édouard Je pourrais vous donner plus de détails, mais essentiellement, ce que, ce que nous avons cherché à faire, et c'est ce que j'ai dit tout à l'heure, c'est à nous assurer qu'il y ait, en termes d'effort de, de réduction de, de, de la pollution, euh, que ce soit équivalent à travers, à travers le pays. Euh, mais nous sommes très flexibles sur la façon de, dont les provinces ou les territoires peuvent, peuvent le faire. Par exemple, le Québec euh, a, a choisi, plutôt d'avoir un système de tarification carbone, a choisi le système de plafonnement et d'échange des émissions de gaz à effet de serre, donc la fameuse bourse du carbone euh, dans laquelle le Québec et la Californie sont entrés en, en accord depuis déjà plusieurs années. Alors, nous faisons des évaluations. C'est vraiment du cas par cas. Euh, Ce n'est pas, euh, pas une approche pour tout le monde. C'est du cas par cas, mais il fallait que les, les, les propositions qui, qui étaient faites par les différentes juridictions passent, passent le test de l'équivalence fédérale. Donc, en gros, ce que proposait, ce que proposait le Duprince-Édouard n'était pas suffisamment ambitieux en termes, de, en termes de réduction de la pollution. 
Et j'ai une question un peu similaire à celle qu'a posée mon, mon collègue en anglais. Les résidents de l'Atlantique dépendent beaucoup euh, du mazout pour se chauffer. Et malgré l'annonce d'hier, euh, tout ne va pas changer en quelques mois en ce qui concerne les systèmes de chauffage dans la région. Donc, quel est votre message pour ces personnes-là qui, à partir de juillet, euh, vont payer beaucoup plus cher leur chauffage la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'au mois de juillet, on n'a généralement plus besoin de beaucoup chauffer euh, dans la plupart des provinces, des, des, des provinces canadiennes. Alors, nous nous donnons un an pour aider des dizaines de milliers de personnes à passer du chauffage au mazout, qui est une forme de chauffage polluant, dispendieux, et, et sur lesquels nous n'avons aucun contrôle sur les prix. Les prix sont déterminés soit par les compagnies pétrolières, les raffineurs ou encore sur les marchés internationaux. Et, et, et bien entendu, l'invasion illégale de, de, de l'Ukraine par la Russie a, a provoqué des chocs importants sur, sur, sur les prix du pétrole brut. Mais si on va avec les pompes à chaleur, l'avantage, évidemment, c'est d'avoir un système qui est beaucoup plus propre, qui est beaucoup plus efficace et qui coûte beaucoup moins cher. Les gens vont économiser des milliers de dollars par année en plus du remboursement du gouvernement fédéral du, du, du prix sur, sur la pollution. Alors, pourquoi voudrait-on faire en sorte que les gens continuent de dépendre d'une forme d'énergie non renouvelable, polluante et plus dispendieuse, alors qu'on peut aller vers des options plus propres, plus écologiques et beaucoup plus efficaces pour, pour le, le portefeuille des consommateurs et des consommatrices? Next question, Jennifer Anderson. Go ahead. Hello, um, Minister. Uh, I'm a reporter in Nova Scotia. I'm wondering what is the status of the province's uh, request for um, an offset-based uh, pricing system for large emitters. I didn't hear a reference in your briefing. Uh, are you willing to accept the, the offset pricing for large emitters that Nova Scotia has proposed? It I, I must confess that the, um, the discussion with Nova Scotia have been uh, interesting um, because last time I was there and I met uh, Premier Houston, he, um, he told me that they had a better plan than, than carbon pricing, which is interesting because you can have a plan and still have carbon pricing and your plan will be even better. But uh, setting that aside, they said that they couldn't do um, an output-based pricing system in, in, uh, in, in Nova Scotia. And um, it seems that after all, they could uh, because they did. And we accepted it. We accepted their proposal after they, they decided to have a serious conversation. So all of this drama could have been avoided. I guess they, they, they wanted the drama. They, they were looking for, for, for it. But, but in the end, they came seriously with a proposal. And we looked at it seriously. And we accepted it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Good job. No follow-up? Next question, Brian Flynn. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Minister Gibo, I just uh, sort of follow up to Jennifer's question. I'm wondering if you'd also characterize um, the province of Nova Scotia's position on, on carbon pricing itself as drama. Um, just yesterday, I, I gather, uh, Premier Houston wrote a letter to you uh, sort of protesting against the system that you're putting in place today. I, I must confess that I'm... I'm extremely disappointed. I mean, we were able to to rapidly come to an agreement with with provinces. Um, I, I'm not I'm not super popular in Alberta or Saskatchewan. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, we were able quickly to come to agreement with with these provinces. And there was no drama in the media about this. Um, they really wanted to ensure that they could have their own system and work towards attaining that objective. And that happened. And I mean, that's also what happened in, in Nova Scotia, but, but clearly with, with, with all the theater and, 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 and drama, I, I had understood that, that Premier Houston portrayed himself as, a, as being a, you know, a progressive conservatives. It is interesting that we had an easier time negotiating this with, with conservatives government in Alberta and Saskatchewan than we did in, in Nova Scotia. I, I guess we don't have the same definition of what progressive uh, means. Um, on the one hand, but but on the other hand, I find it um, unconscionable, really, that Premier Houston would have this type of attitude after what we've seen in Atlantic Canada with the passage of the most severe hurricane in the history of Canada. We, we've never seen anything like this. Law, lives were lost. And, and this is because of climate change and putting a price on pollution. I just came back from Egypt. 
uh, at the at COP27. And all the people who have studied this, the experts, the economists, the, the, the scientists, are saying that putting a price on pollution is one of the most effective ways of, of doing this. And the International Monetary Fund goes even further and says that if all the major emitters, so G20, would use the same type of pricing on pollution that we do in Canada, we would be almost a third of our way to achieve, globally to achieve the, the, the goal of the Paris Agreement. They're, they're quoting our pricing system as being a world example to be, to be, to be followed. Um, so, I, frankly, I'm, I'm baffled by, by Premier Houston's position. I can't help but add to that, Stephen. Uh, I think it's pretty simple, actually. I think that um, uh, companies don't vote, people do, consumers do. And so that's why you're seeing more drama on that front than you are with uh, you know, larger emitters where we've been able to find agreement with certain provinces. And what I particularly resent uh, is the stoking of drama and anxiety amongst people, whether it be in my province or any, anywhere in the country. There is enough going on in the world right now that if anybody repeats the phrase that this will be a cold winter and somehow we're to blame, that is so deliberately misleading, as we've just spelled out for you again now, anybody who talks about that, I don't care, anybody who stokes more anxiety in people than they already need, it's unconscionable. There is enough going on, and as we say in Newfoundland, people's nerves are rubbed raw. <laughs> Everybody calm down. This is a good plan, and there will be more money in your bank account than there was before. And you will be doing something very effective, whether you're in Burgio, Port of Basque, or Marguerite, or anywhere in the country, to say that you are helping in a way to make sure that we lower emissions. But stop stoking people's fear and anxiety. It is absolutely unconscionable right now. Good job. Follow up, Brian? Next yes. question. Yes. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, I was wondering if I could just have a quick follow up. Well, it might not be quick, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, Nova Scotia's assertion uh, has been that that the the plan the province submitted in September would have would have met uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets without placing a consumer price on pollution. I'm just wondering if you could specifically respond to that assertion. As I said earlier, you, I mean, look at what we're doing federally. We fought all the way to the Supreme Court to be able to to make sure that pollution wouldn't be free anymore in. In, in Canada. We're investing $120 billion in transit, electrification, uh, transforming Canada's auto sector, efficiency at our homes and, and in our businesses and in our, in our companies. And, and we're also using regulatory tools to ensure that 100% of light duty vehicles sold in Canada will be net zero, uh, net zero, uh, zero emission vehicles, sorry. We're also putting in place a, a net zero uh, electricity regulations to ensure that our electricity mix is as clean as possible in, 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 in 2035. All of these things will mean cheaper cost for energy for people. Operating an electric vehicle is about one six, one seven, depending on where you are, than the cost of an internal combustion engine. That means more money in 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 in, in people's pocket. So you, I, the fact that Nova Scotia had a plan is is a good thing, but but it's it's simply not true that their plan was better without pricing, because they can have a, the plan and pricing and they make their plan even better as we're doing at the federal level. Brian, it's uh, Cody Blois, the Member of Parliament in Kings Hanson. Your question specifically was about the government's plan of Nova Scotia. And I want to take you back to August, as I remember many of our colleagues were sitting and uh, as Minister Gibo has said, this has been years in the making in terms of the dialogue and conversation. And you'll remember that Premier Houston just simply said, well, we have no plan. That was the original position of the government of Nova Scotia. Thankfully, they did come back on the output-based pricing system, which has been accepted by the government of Canada. But it is a requirement across the country to have some price of pollution on retail fuels. And as Minister O'Regan has said, we welcome, we're, we're agnostic to the fact whether or not that's the government of Canada's plan or a provincial-made plan. 
if Premier Houston had a better plan in place, I would have liked to seen it. If he actually thinks that there's a better plan there, I would have welcomed it. But I don't know if they actually sat down to do the work because the original position was we just don't want anything. They did come back with the output-based pricing system, which is important for industrial competitiveness in Nova Scotia. If they wanted to bring forward a system, would have liked to seen it. I contrast that to Premier McNeil who I know his government sat there for two years. They came up with a solution on the cap and trade. Uh, different standards at the time were moving to be able to fight climate change. Uh, but I, I, I hope that's something, Brian, you take back and ask the Premier about where their plan was and whether or not they were actually sincere about putting something in place that supports Nova Scotians and also moves the needle on uh, fighting climate change. And I'm told this is the last question. Andrea Gunn, please unmute yourself. Hi there, uh, Andrea Gunn from All Newfoundland Labrador. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, Newfoundland and Labrador's proposal and why sort of it was, wasn't uh, accepted in the kind of process. I know that there was a couple of letters from our Premier asking for more time, and um, I'm wondering if there's going to be any future discussions or if this is sort of like a done deal now. Just sort of some insight on that from your perspective. Thank you for the question. As I said earlier, uh, we have been in discussions with provinces and territories for over a year uh, on on, on, on this. Um, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador had multiple occasion uh, to come up with, with, with their own plan, their own proposal. They waited until the very last minute and said, oh, well, we need, we need more time. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but, but to me, uh, this was nothing short of a stalling tactics. Uh, to try and, and as opposed to everyone else across the country, not do their fair share. And I think Canadians understand that we all need to do our fair share when it comes to fighting pollution and fighting climate change. So uh, th we, we gave them numerous, multiple opportunities at, uh, at the departmental level, at the political level. I went myself uh, to, to, to meet with, Pre with Premier Fury. I've had, I've had number of conversations with... Um, with uh, Minister Minister Davies uh, on on this uh, over the last year, so it's not because we didn't try and we didn't give them enough time uh, for them to be able to come up with with their own uh, solutions. Yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, look, there's not much light between us on this. Uh, you know, it's it's important to remember that Newfoundland and Labrador is the only legislature in North America. Uh, that has passed net zero legislation unanimously. All parties agreed to it. Um, Minister Davis was just uh, with Minister Guibo uh, at the last COP. Min uh, Pre Premier Fury uh, was at the COP previous. Uh, you know, they're committed to doing this and, uh, and, and committing to lowering the emissions of the province. Um, uh, ultimately, I think we've landed in a good place because I think Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are going to get a lot more back in their pocketbook. Uh, it is a good system that works in Ontario, that works in, in Alberta, uh, and now it will work in the Maritimes in Newfoundland and Labrador. Ultimately, people are going to get more money, and we're going to meet them halfway on things like, like heat pumps. So we will continue working with the province as closely as we do. We are very much aligned on, on our goals and, and how we get there. Okay. Good, thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Andrea? Uh, yeah, just um, specifically what the sticking point in our plan that we proposed that so that it wasn't sort of accepted in the new plan or the, the benchmark was imposed on us as a province. Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, what was this, I guess, the, the issue with our proposal? I know it was very similar or identical to the 2019 proposal or 2018 proposal, I guess, that caused um, our province to not to be have this benchmark kind of like imposed. Um, what was the issue with our proposal specifically? Well, the stringency. Obviously, um, we're not in, in 2019 or 2018 anymore. We need to have more stringency because we need to do more when it comes to, to fighting climate pollution in, in, in Canada. Um, it's interesting that the people who talk about the impacts, the, the economic impacts, will don't talk about the rebate that people get on the one hand, and they don't talk about the billions of dollars that climate change is costing Canadians. We're all paying for this. There's no hiding. There's nowhere to run on this. We're all paying the cost of climate change in, in Canada. And unless we do our fair share, and everyone needs to do it globally, we will keep paying and paying those billions of dollars. It could go up to $25 billion per year in 2025, according to the Climate Change Institute. We need to do this. And I think Canadians understand, and they want to do their fair share and to be part of this. Thank you.
I'll speak to it again, too, because it's, you know, it's Newfoundland and Labrador particularly. Um, I think it's really important because I know the debate at home is really just has been centered on home heating oil. And it's important, again, to remember that home heating oil is, is, a, is, a, is a minority uh, of how most people get their uh, home heat in Newfoundland and Labrador. We benefit from great hydroelectricity, so, uh, which, which is regulated by uh, the PUB. So that, that they, you know, pe most people aren't affected. This doesn't happen until July. I am sick and tired of people talking about the cold winter and what we're doing. That does not happen until July, and this will by far benefit more people in Newfoundland and Labrador because it encompasses way more than home heating oil. It encompasses the, everything from A to Z where there has been a price on pollution, all of it, and all of it going back with more pot money in the pockets of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. So this changes the debate that people have been having at home entirely, and I stand here very proudly uh, knowing that we put more money into the pockets of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Yes. And this concludes the press conference. This is the conference of press. Merci.